Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, th there's not too many people here in uh, person. So uh, whoever wants to participate over uh, Zoom is more than welcome. Um, you can either uh, send me a message on the chat if you would like to uh, ask something, or alternatively, you can just unmute your mic and just let me know. I just muted the mics because uh, uh, sometimes there's just a bit of interference on our side. Um, so today we're going to cover another ECG topic. Uh, well, we're going to analyze the ECG, and I think it's a uh, fitting ECG considering the weekend we just had. Uh, so <laughs> I hope everybody will enjoy it. Um, uh, let's start. So uh, as usual, we normally just start with a little uh, backdrop of what we should do for each and every ECG, uh, and that is analyze the axis, analyze the rhythm, in which we'll analyze our P waves, we look at our PR interval, we look at our QRS complexes, uh, we look at whether we have a QRS after every P, whether we have regular groupings. Uh, and then of course we will analyze rate. And uh, then finally we'll analyze each zone and see what we notice that may be a bit abnormal. Um, so I'm hoping uh, everybody will enjoy today. It's a bit uh, different to what we've done before. Uh, and I hope somebody will get the answer, but uh, let's see what happens. So our history today, and we're going to make this a bit larger on the screen as well, is we've got a 52-year-old homeless alcoholic man found lying in an alley. That's it. That's all that we have. So already we've got a patient There's not much. We just know that he's uh, got a lowered level of consciousness and that he's not okay. Uh, you know, in these types of patients, your ECG is not going to be your first uh, point of call. You would have put on monitors. You would have taken blood gases. You would have done a whole lot of things to check for what could be happening. And then uh, as part of the workup, you would do an ECG to exclude ischemia and things like that. So uh, let's enlarge this a little bit and then just go through it step by step. And I hope somebody will be able to um, give us some sort of an answer. So the one thing you'll notice on this one, we don't have a rhythm strip. We just have our normal ECG. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is we'll have a look at our axis. So if anybody wants to pipe in and give me the answer, that's not a problem. Alternatively, we can work it out. So we've got uh, lead one pointing upwards and we've got lead AVF uh, pointing upwards as well. So let's just uh, draw it out there quickly. All right, and let's just make our little grid. Uh, all right, with our four axis normal, left, extreme, right and right. And we've got lead one over here. All right, and then we've got, let's just put a little F over there for lead AVF. All right, so the first thing you notice is lead one is positive. So that means that the, uh, the, the electrical axis is either towards the left or towards normal because lead one must be able to see it as positive. And if you look at lead AVF, lead AVF is also positive, uh, which means that our axis is either there or down here. And we can see that we've got the uh, agreeable one is in the normal axis. So we've got a normal axis over there. So that, that's just a little start for us. Okay, so we do have a normal axis. Now we're gonna have a look at the rhythm, which might be a bit tricky in this one because we don't have a full rhythm strip. Now, sometimes this does happen, uh, but uh, let's just assume for some reason because they're not too worried about the rhythm from the, um, the authors of the book that we're using. But let's just uh, go through and have a look. So the first thing we're gonna look for is we're gonna try and look for P waves and see if we can see them anyway. And uh, if you have a good look through this ECG, you'll actually notice that it's quite difficult to pick out P waves. It's not that simple. We can maybe make out one there. Is this a P wave? Is this a P wave? Is this a P wave? It's difficult to say. So what we can assume is that the patient is not still the patient is moving around. And uh, it's a bit of a difficult one, but I think from all of them, uh, the closest that we can get probably uh, to a P wave is uh, probably around here in lead V3. So the reason for, for me saying that is that here you can see a little T wave, and then after that you get a P wave as well. So if we were to look, and if we were to, we, we could of course say that this is an atrial fibrillation, or this is a junctional rhythm without P wave activity, that's for sure. And when we get to the answer, we'll see what they say to us. But if we assume that this is a P wave, then we've got a PR distance of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a very prolonged PR interval, which means that it's a first degree 
heart block. Okay. Uh, so if you've got a first degree heart block in and of itself is not diagnostic of anything, but it is a bit of a worrying thing. Uh, the one thing that we do notice is that the P waves themselves are quite regular, even in the short little example. So it would be a technically a sinus rhythm, but we know that there's a first degree heart block. Um, then we look at our QRS complexes. So what we notice is that we've got relatively narrow uh, QRS complexes all throughout the place. And uh, We've just got these odd QRS complexes from time to time. So these look like premature ventricular contractions from time to time. So these are things that you would want to check on a rhythm strip, which unfortunately we don't have over here. And uh, and we need to check if we have a uh, QRS after every P. Uh, even though from this little rhythm, it does look like it. When we look at this one, it may not necessarily be so. So we've got this bit of an abnormal rhythm that's going on as well. Um, and then the last thing we check for is just if it's regular grouping. So we do have some regular grouping. So uh, this may also be just a conduction abnormality. I mean, not conduction, but just uh, conduction to the machine. So it may be from the patient moving that we're getting these odd uh, little spikes over here because they don't really appear anywhere else. So, um, you know, these are the things that we need to consider because uh, as we say, he's, he was just found lying in an alley. We don't know what happened. Uh, all right, so let's look at our rate. So the rate that we're looking at is we've got one, two, three, four, four and a half. So just about 75, closer to 80 beats per minute. And uh, if we analyze each zone, uh, then we've got to start going through that. So if we look at the inferior zone, two, three, and AVF, I'm not sure if anybody has any idea of what we might be seeing over there. I'll give you a little clue. If I was you, I would look at the morphology of the QRS complexes themselves, besides just looking at ST segments and things like that. And uh, if nobody's in the mood to talk, that's fine as well. Because <laughs> I know it's a bit different from what we've, we've dealt with before. We're actually trying to now make diagnoses on an ECG compared to uh, just looking for ischemia and rhythm disturbances and things like that. So. Um, in order not to make things too complicated, let me try and take everybody through it. But let's just go through what we know already. So what we see is this bit of a down sloping ST segment with inverted T waves. That's what we can see on the inferior aspect of the, um, of the heart. Uh, if we come across to the septum, then again, we see this little, uh, sorry, uh, we see this little, uh, you know, ST, deviation and going up to an ST, I mean, into a T wave, or maybe it's a P wave, it's difficult to say. If you look at the rest of the septum, we've got a very poorly connected V2, so it's difficult to say what's going on over there. If we come to the anterior part of the heart, V3 and V4, again, we see this odd shaped ST segment. It's a very odd shape. It's not the normal shape that we normally see. And when we come to the lateral edge of the, of the heart, V5, V6, leads one in AVL. Again, we see the strange morphology with this down sloping ST segment, which is not normal. We don't normally see that. All right. Now, uh, does anybody want to tell me what looks strange? You don't necessarily have to give a diagnosis, but there's something that doesn't look odd. Even if we go to the right side of the heart, this morphology doesn't look right. Okay. So we've got an RS. And is, is this RSR? Does anybody have an idea of what this could be? Because it just doesn't look normal. Agreed. Let's go back to our patient. So we've got 52 year old, homeless, alcoholic, found lying in an alley with a first degree heart block. We're guessing a diminished uh, level of consciousness. And uh, we need to find out what's going on. So what would be your differentials for such a patient? Number one, of course, you could look at aspiration because he is an alcoholic. So could he have aspirated into the lung? Could he be having some problem over there? Could it be an ischemic event, which it definitely can be because the patient has now dropped down. Uh, homeless people are not immune to having ischemia and ischemic events. So that has to be one of your other differentials. Notice the history that they give is that he's homeless. So if he's homeless, that means he's exposed to the elements. So is there any idea of what could be happening, especially given the the weekend that we just had. <laughs> I think on Saturday, everybody <laughs> felt it. <laughs> we all had our blankets on, heaters on, everything was on. So what would a homeless person be exposed to? 
cold and what could cause lead to hypothermia. So that's another differential that we need to look at. Any other differentials that we could possibly look at? CVAs, all right? Strokes, which fall under ischemia as well. The alcoholic, liver dysfunction, all right? Clotting disorders, things like that. He could be going, having a DIC, he could be having a, a cerebral bleed. There's lots of things that could be happening over there. Um, the patient could be anemic from an, a GI bleed as well. Could be having esophageal varices, could be having liver cirrhosis. You know, there's a lot that's going on just from the history that they gave us. So what you would do for this patient is that you would actually follow all of those leads. So you'd look for aspiration. You would look at your sets. You would look at your ECG. You would look at your overall neurological function. You would look at all of these things. And then once you've done all of those, you would actually have to take the temperature of the patient as well. And what you'd find in this patient particularly is that this patient actually is hypothermic. The reason why I mention this is because even in our setting in Newcastle and wherever you may be, wherever you may be listening from, you have a lot of patients who are exposed to the elements, uh, especially at this time of the year and now that we're getting into the winter months. But the question may be, how is the ECG going to tell me that this patient is hypothermic? And the problem is that the ECG can't tell you for sure. It can't give you a 100% accurate definition that this is hypothermia, but it does give you a very good clue. And that clue is actually this little wave over here. Now, I know this may seem strange, like we should be learning about ischemias, why are we learning about this? The reason being this little wave can actually save you about two hours of testing. All right, especially considering the history that we have. Now, you may ask, what is this little wave? So let's get on to it and let's have a look and let's learn something new. So I wasn't too worried if people didn't get the answer, but let's just see. So the first thing that we see is that we've got an accelerated AV junctional rhythm. So why do they say that? They say that because there are no P waves, all right? So we don't have, what we thought was a P wave is actually not a P wave. And we did say it could be a junctional rhythm. The reason why they say it's accelerated is because a junctional rhythm is normally a bit slower than this. Normal, a normal junctional rhythm is between 60 to, uh, 60, 50 to 60 beats or 70 beats at the most. Once it goes between 70 and 100, then it's called accelerated. Once it goes above 100, then it's called a junctional tachycardia. Okay. So they had a rate of 84, which is more or less what we got to, a prolonged QT. All right. So the prolonged QT, uh, which is basically from here to here, which is something, sorry, I missed that as well. But a prolonged QT is definitely something that we should look at because what a prolonged QT tells you about is that it could be any of the hypoelectrolytes, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hyponatremia, all of those you have to consider when you've got a prolonged QT, uh, complex, a prolonged QT interval, along with congenital QT prolongation, certain drugs also cause that. So that's one of the things that we could look at. And then this was the important thing, J waves, which are suggestive of hypothermia. So the question is, what is a J wave? So you have Q, R, S, T, U, but <laughs> no J, J comes long before. <laughs> so this is actually called a J wave, all right? This little thing that's occurring over there. And J waves are actually very common, although not pathognomic, but J waves are very common in hypothermia, okay? And uh, because the patient is shivering, this patient's body temperature was found to be 25.6 degrees Celsius, which is almost not compatible with life. So, you know, that this is one of the things that we need to know because it's something we'll actually see in the coming months. Um, you are going to get patients who are exposed to the elements. We get a lot of cases of patients being assaulted, thrown into the rivers. Uh, we get a lot of uh, instances of patients getting drunk and falling asleep outside and being exposed to the elements as well. So J waves, now the actual name, they are known as Osborne waves, all right? They are most notable in the precordial lead, so that means uh, V2, V3, V4, V5. And they are positive deflections in the terminal portions of the QRS complex. So that means when you come to the QRS complex, towards the end of it, it's a little positive deflection that we see here in all the precordial leads, although you can see it a little bit in the inferior leads as well, right? So the exact cause of the J wave in hypothermic patients is unknown, which is good because it would take a long time to explain if it was known, why would the heart react in this way, all right? Although considered highly sensitive and specific for hypothermia, 
J waves are not pathognomic for hypothermia. So in other words, it has to correlate with what you're seeing on your patient. So you have to see a cold temperature, a physically taken cold temperature. And that's not just a peripheral temperature. You have to take a core temperature as well, which means you have to do a rectal, a rectal thermometry as well to actually check and make sure. So what else is hypothermia uh, associated with? Prolongation of the QRS. So you can have wide QRS complexes and QT intervals, all right? So in this case, QT was 0 0.54, QTC 0 0.64. If you didn't understand that, don't worry, we are going to cover it in later, in later sections, but uh, we just wanted to go through it. So other causes of prolonged QT intervals include, like I say, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, myocardial infarct, elevated intracranial pressure can also cause it, and drugs with sodium channel blocking effects, uh, cyclic antidepressants, quinidine, and congenital prolonged QT syndrome. So there's a lot of things that cause the QT to actually become uh, prolonged. And it's something that we need to know as well, but we're gonna cover the QT part of it in a, little, in a little while, not right now. So QT interval prolongation in hypothermia and hypocalcemia is completely due to ST segment prolongation. The T waves remain unchanged. This is not true for other causes of QT prolongation. So if you caught all of that, that's very good. <laughs> but I've got my young student in front of me and he's frowning because it's a lot to take in at one point. So don't concentrate on that part of it. We'll get into how you diagnose QTs and how you worry about QTs later on because it's quite an involved topic on its own. The most important thing for us to concentrate on is just the J waves today. So let's have a look at what the J wave actually is. All right. So this is the J wave or the Osborne wave. So the reason why I say it's a bit odd uh, is because it, it could, for instance, be regarded as an R, S, R prime, uh, which means an R is a positive deflection, S is your negative deflection, and then your first uh, R wave again is also called an R prime. The main difference with it is that an R prime doesn't start towards the end. Uh, and it's actually slightly different, which we'll get to in other lectures as well. Uh, but in this case, this is not an R prime. Okay. So uh, this is, like I say, it's not pathognomic of hypothermia, but it is highly suggestive, right? Highly suggestive. So generally it occurs in patients who are already below 32 degrees Celsius, okay? Can be a normal variant as well. So you have to actually have a look at it. It can be a result of hypercalcemia, neurological insult with increased uh, intracranial pressure, certain medications, and even ventricular fibrillation, post-ventricular fibrillation, it can happen. Right, you won't see it during actual brief. It's generally most prominent in the precordial leads, and the size of the wave correlates with the degree of hypothermia, and it usually resolves with warming, which is actually something that can guide you as to whether that was the cause of the J wave. Because remember, if because it's not pathognomic, you've got to look at other causes of it as well. What if this patient has raised ICP? What if this patient also fell, suffered an intracranial injury? So you have to know those things as well. Unfortunately, it's of no prognostic value. Now, we've had a good few patients come in with these J waves over the years. And unfortunately, once you do see it, it means you do have to treat the patient. One of the things I'm often asked is, how do you treat these patients? Let me just hide this for a second. Uh, so how do you manage hypothermia? So the easiest thing to do is actually warm the patient up. But the question is, how? How do you warm a patient up? Because you could throw a kettle, of, you know, a kettle full of boiling water on top of them, and technically you're warming them up. But that's not actually how we do it in uh, an AME setting. So the first thing is, it, it all goes with the extent of the hypothermia. So mild hypothermia should respond just with warm IV fluids. And most emergency departments come equipped with an IV warmer. So if it's working correctly and you start instilling warm fluids, you will actually start finding your patient's body temperature rising. The problem is warm fluids essentially don't warm up your core that much. What they are doing is they're actually warming up your peripheries. Even though they get into the central circulation, by the time they get into the central circulation, most of the warmth has actually escaped from the fluid into the surrounding tissue. Then the next thing, even though we're not supposed to use trade names, but is a bear hugger. So a bear hugger is essentially a device that blows warm air in a controlled environment around the patient. And what this does is also creates peripheral warming. So what you are hoping is that by warming the peripheries, you will then divert that warm blood towards the core and then start warming up the core as well. The another one that's often used in conjunction is a space blanket. So what a space blanket does is essentially causes a vacuum around the patient. It doesn't allow heat to escape and reflex heat back onto the patient. But again, 
it's just a peripheral warming device. You must remove all wet clothes. So it doesn't matter what made it wet. Is it blood? Is it water? Is it other fluids? You have to remove all of that. And that should actually be closer to the start, but it's something that's often forgotten. And the thing is, it doesn't matter how much you, um, you warm this patient. You haven't removed the wet clothes. Uh, it doesn't make a difference, you know? And in fact, if you're stuck on a hot day and if you need to cool your drinks very quickly, wrap them in cool tissue paper and put them in the freezer. And within 15 minutes, you've actually got a frozen drink because that's how much it affects temperature. You know? Now, what happens if our patient has profound hypothermia? We need to do central warming. So the question is, how do you do central warming? Now, there's a few ways that you can try, but this is probably the easiest, and that's bladder lavage. So you may ask, what is bladder lavage? So you don't have to remove the bladder. It's actually quite easy. Bladder lavage is basically instead inserting a urinary catheter, a normal Foley's catheter into the patient. You then take warmed fluid. Now, remember, you're not using hot fluid. You don't want to cause uh, thermic injury as well, thermal injury. So what you do is then pass these fluids, about two to 300 mils at a time, into the bladder. So you pass the fluid in, you leave it there for a minute, remove it again. Pass the fluid in, allow it to sit for a little while, remove it again. And you keep on doing this. And this actually allows you to warm the core because the bladder is situated quite close to the core. Is it the best? No, because you're still a bit isolated from the absolute core. So what are the others that you can use? That's th thoracic and peritoneal lavage. So the thoracic lavage, what it involves is actually inserting icy drains into the patient. Now, the problem with this is that you have a patient who doesn't actually have a lung injury. So you don't want to cause a lung injury. So in inserting your IC drain, you have to be extremely careful. You have to make sure that you sweep that area once you get in, move the lung completely out of the way, then instill your IC drain. Once you've instilled the IC drain, you then follow the same principle. You instill warmed water into the thoracic cavity, and then you allow it to drain out. You instill it into the thoracic cavity, and you allow it to drain out. How much? About 500 mils at a time. The problem for this is that there's a high potential for injury. Cardiac injury, if you're not careful, lung injury should go without saying. So you may just provide the patient with a pneumothorax or a hemothorax on top of their hypothermia as well. And then, of course, there's a discomfort associated with an intercostal drain. And then peritoneal lavage is kind of outdated now, but still used in profound um, hypothermia, where what happens is that you basically make an incision towards the epigastrium of the, of the patient. You then instill fluids via an IV line. So you just set up a little IV line with warm fluids and you allow that liter, two liters to pass into the, into the abdominal cavity. And then you've got to drain it out again. So the problem that comes with the draining out is that you may not be able to drain all of it out at the same time. So the basic premise is that you hold the bag up allow all the water to run in, and then you basically <laughs> put the bag down and hope that a lot of the fluid, or with physical aspiration, try and take out as much fluid as possible. It's not something I've ever done personally. I've done the thoracic lavage, but never the peritoneal lavage. And it has become a bit outdated and a bit, uh, how do I say, uh, a bit barbaric actually in this day and age, because there's such a high potential for intra-abdominal injury, the need to take the patient to theater, should you hit one of the vital organs. So it's really not looked at. So thoracic lavage would probably be the area that we would go to as the last resort in our emergency department. Then you get commercial warming devices. You haven't really gone through here because in the public service, we don't really have access to them. So there are uh, warming beds uh, similar to sun tanning machines and things like that that actually provide high amounts of heat to a patient and allow them to come out of a hypothermic state. But they're not widely used. They're not widely recognized. They're currently in developmental stages in some cases. They haven't been FDA approved in the States, for example. But these are the things that we can do. So it is something that we are going to start seeing over the next few months. And we can expect a few patients, no matter where we are working. So I'm not sure if there's any questions. Or anybody is a bit worried. But the one thing that I would like to just stick on is just this uh, J-Wave. And I think if you can remember this from today's meeting, you would have learned quite a bit because it's often something that you do see and it's something that points you in the right direction and can save you a lot of time as well, but that a lot of people don't recognize even the clinical uh, cause of the uh, clinical state of the patient. Now, this doesn't mean if you've got hypothermia, you just leave it at that. You've obviously got to look for the other differentials that we had mentioned. So you would still look for aspiration, for example, liver dysfunction, 
intracranial injury and things like that. Um, but this at least points you in a very good direction as to what could be going on with the patient. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions or if anybody would like to know something. I know it's a bit of a deviation from what we normally do, but given the past weekend, I thought it was quite appropriate that we actually learn about it. Uh, even for uh, those who may not be working in an emergency setting, in our public hospitals, sometimes our patients are exposed to cold, even at night in the wards and things like that, poor heating, and they may start deteriorating. And they may not go as low as 25, but we may just need to have a look at them. Um, if there's no questions, um, uh, or if you think of questions later, you're more than welcome to um, message me and I'll try and answer to the best of my ability. Um, but otherwise we'll end the meeting here. The emergency department is a bit understaffed today, so i <laughs> try and get to work. Um, but I hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, we'll meet again on Wednesday for another ultrasound meeting. And uh, yeah, we'll end it there. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, and if there are any questions after that, please feel free to message me um, and we'll take it further from there. Okay, thanks everybody, bye.